Hi, welcome to Happy Tales. I'm Cheryl Rosenthal, Communications and Education Coordinator at the Oshkosh Area Humane Society. And today our show is all about separation anxiety. And joining me today is Jody Hergert Andreessen from Positive Directions and her beautiful dog, Maya, uh, who's going to demonstrate for us um, some of the things that we can do to prevent separation anxiety uh, and to make our dogs happy when they're home alone. So welcome, Jody. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. Welcome, and thanks for having me. You're welcome. Um, what, what is the biggest thing that you hear about separation anxiety? Um, people think that their dog has separation anxiety, but they may not have separation anxiety. How, how do you know if your dog has separation anxiety or not? What separation anxiety is, is a dog's feeling anxious in anticipation of its owner's leaving. So they will be anxious both before the owner leaves as well as after the owner leaves and they can continue to be anxious for the entire duration of the owner being gone. Okay. So sometimes people think that separation anxiety is the dog is spiteful, or they're angry, or they're jealous that the person's going, um, but that's, it's not any of those things. Okay. It is a true anxiety disorder. It's, it's kind of like when humans have a panic attack, like you may be in a grocery store, and all of a sudden you have this overwhelming panic. Exactly. Uh, and you don't, you don't know how to control that, and, and you can't control it. So it's really something that the dog isn't doing intentionally. Exactly. Um, so it, it's a true mental disorder mm -hmm. um, or phobia. It is. And Cheryl, it's estimated that about 14% of companion dogs have separation anxiety. Um, it's seen equally among males and females. It's seen equally among dogs who are um, mixed breed versus purebred dogs although dogs, dogs who have been rehomed are more likely to have issues with separation okay. anxiety. Can we as humans, as pet owners, can we create a dog to have separation anxiety? Um, yes and no. Um, current current uh, research shows that, si that separation anxiety is more of a genetic issue. Okay. Dogs who are prone to separation anxiety tend to have other disorders. They tend to have issues with going in the crate. They tend to be sound sensitive. They might be thunderstorm phobic. So the current research says that there's a genetic piece to it. Okay. Um, other things that contribute um, can be a traumatic experience. Say a dog is left home alone and there's a bad thunderstorm or there's construction okay. next door. Uh, or, or like uh, if somebody lives near an airport and there's you know, a certain time of day, there's certain jets that are going over, or I, I think I read that in the Patricia McConnell book, where a dog was really having a problem being home alone, and they found out that at a certain time of day, there were jets flying low over the mm -hmm. house, causing the dog to, you know, just really panic yes. and, and become very anxious about being in that situation. Yes. And, and I know for myself personally, I had a dog that he loved his crate, he was fine being home alone, and when he was about seven or eight years old, we experienced an extraordinary, terrible uh, thunderstorm, and when we came home, he had chewed the woodwork and literally had broken through one of our um, bedroom windows and jumped outside mm -hmm. to try to, almost like trying to get away, and he had never done anything like that before. And after that experience, uh, it was very difficult at times to leave him you know, home alone if, if we knew that there was uh, bad weather coming. Right, right. So, so a traumatic incident like that can um, cause a dog to begin to have separation anxiety issues. Can trigger that. Uh, other things that can, tr can contribute would be something traumatic like a dog being over crated. So sometimes people crate dogs way, way, way too long. Um, crating them all day while they're at work and then crating them again at night. Yes. Uh, I would think that exercise has a lot to do with this too. Mm -hmm. uh, dogs oftentimes don't get enough outlet for exercise. Right. Um, things that we do, there's patterns that we do before we're leaving the house. Um, I know that I have a ritual that I go through before I leave the house. Mm -hmm. um, and <coughs> now I have a, an instant where if I'm clearing off the kitchen table and I pick up my car keys, my one dog, he'll automatically go in his crate. Even if I'm just picking up my mm -hmm. car keys to put them in my purse, um, he'll, he'll go in his crate. And he just sees that as a signal that I'm leaving. But for some dogs, rather than going into their crate and being very comfortable like my Brody is, there's other dogs that they see this as the start of, oh, they're leaving, oh, they're leaving. What right. am I going to do? What am I going to do? Right. And, and so it truly is... Um, they're, they're getting very anxious about their, their owner leaving. Yeah, let's talk about um, what separation anxiety looks like okay. um, and, and, and other things that it might not be. Okay. So 
common symptoms of separation anxiety, and they can, they can, um, there are quite a few of them, but more, most common symptoms are pacing, panting, circling before the owner goes, getting restless, sometimes retreating or hiding. Um, and then after the owner leaves, very common things that you will see are digging, chewing, um, especially at points of departure, so at the doors where the owners have left. Oh, okay. um, you'll see urinating and defecating, sometimes where the owners have left or in the dog's crate. Um, you'll see the dog desperately trying to get out of their crate or trying to get out of the home to rejoin okay. their owners. And, so those and, are the most and common. And drooling, mm -hmm. excessive drooling. We're yes. not talking about, you know, when they salivate because you've got a tasty treat. Right. We're talking about profusely drooling where they're literally drenched in their right. own where there's, saliva. Where there's puddles of saliva and their chest is okay. full of saliva. So and barking and vocalizing is, is another. Okay. So whining, barking, mm -hmm. sometimes repetitively, sometimes right. dogs will bark. For right. hours. And I, and I know you know my dog, Phantom. Uh, we, we feel that he was a victim of being overcrated. I can't say that he definitely had separation anxiety, but he actually must have chewed on a crate because of being crated all the time. Mm -hmm. So he actually has uh, wear on his teeth from trying to get out of his crate sure. uh, to chew his way out. And I think some dogs with separation anxiety have done that also. Yes. Um, yeah, and there are some dogs who have separation anxiety, and there are some dogs who have confinement um, anxiety, which are really okay. two different issues. Okay. So you can have a dog who, toler who doesn't tolerate being crated, but would do um, okay left alone correct. in like, the kitchen or maybe the den or if you have a spare bedroom. Right. So not necessarily leaving the dog in the whole home. Right. Uh, is, is that more difficult for a dog with separation anxiety be, to have access to the entire home? Uh, it depends on the dog. It okay. depends on the dog. So yeah, it's really important to rule out other things. So sometimes people think their dog has separation anxiety, but if you start looking into the details of the behavior, you find out, in fact, that they don't. So other common things that can be misdiagnosed for separation anxiety are just boredom. Sometimes a puppy being left alone in too much space with too much freedom. Mm -hmm. um, medical issues, house training issues. Um, Cognitive dysfunction, which is um, the, the canine version of Alzheimer's. Okay. So if you have a dog or dementia, if you have an older dog, um, they may be developing cognitive dysfunction, okay. um, fears, phobias. So there's a whole host of things okay. that, that, can, um, that need to be eliminated before you look at it as separation, as separation anxiety. Because mm -hmm. I know, again, with puppies or younger dogs, I go to work and I let my dog have free run of my house. And if I don't have appropriate things for my dog to be chewing on or playing with, he may decide, well, that couch looks really good, or I really like those slippers she wears, so I'm going to chew those up, right. or I'm going to chew up all the cat toys. And, and it's, you know, it's kind of like a free-for-all because there's nobody here to interrupt mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Um, that can easily happen, particularly with a young dog. Most dogs, many dogs, need to be crated up until they're about two years of age. So sometimes if you give a young dog too much freedom too quickly, mm -hmm. they'll get into things in your house, which is, again, not necessarily right. separation so when, anxiety. when I'm home, I'm in charge, but when I'm gone, my dog may think, huh, she's not here to stop me, so now I'm in charge, so this is an opportune time for me to... Well, either that or if you're gone for eight hours, they've just got lots of time to get into things. Yeah. So it may or may not be a statement about the owner and their relationship mm -hmm. as much it is, as it is of, huh, no one's here, I'm kind of bored, what can I do? Yeah, what can I do? So. What, what do we do if we find out, is separation anxiety treatable? I think sometimes people think, oh, I, I can't ever crate my dog, and that has to do with, you know, a, a different phobia, mm -hmm. uh, confinement. Um, but you should be able to leave your dog home alone. Mm -hmm. And so is that something that you can modify so that the dog can start to have a pleasant experience Absolutely. when the owner is gone? Absolutely. Um, you know, separation anxiety can range from broad, or broadly from very mild to quite severe. And of course, the more mild it is, the easier it is to work with. The more severe it is, the more difficult and the more um, time and effort it may take to work through it. But many, many cases can be improved, if not completely eliminated. Let's discuss prevention and treatment, because I know some of the things that you would do for treatment, maybe some of the things you also should be do for, for prevention. Absolutely. But First of all, we need to make sure that we really know that our dog has separation anxiety. Mm -hmm. What I think you had mentioned there's another tool that we can, can use to really know if our dog has separation mm -hmm. anxiety. Yeah, videotaping or tape recording can be a really great tool. So sometimes you find out 
oh, my dog was barking when I left, but it turns out he only barks for 30 seconds. You know, we're not necessarily so concerned about that. But the videotape might also reveal, wow, he's barking for two hours, or wow, he's whining intermittently. So videotaping or even tape recording can be really helpful. You know, you can set up just a little cassette tape recorder right next to your dog's crate okay. and tape them. You know, how long are they barking? Are they whining? Can you hear them, you know, spinning right. or shuffling around? And video recording can be really helpful, too. Okay. Well, and they have so many of those electronics now that are readily available that you can, you know, on your computer, set up a little camera mm -hmm. and, and you can, like a webcam, and, and you can see what your dog is doing. And that probably is really, really a great idea. It's super helpful for finding out exactly what is going on. And it's also helpful for finding out how much better are they getting, you know, so we can videotape and evaluate, you know. To make um, sure that there is an improvement, improvement. When, when, you're, when you're doing some of the uh, treatments. So what, yeah. what are some treatments slash preventions that owners can, can Oh, there's do? a whole host of things you can do. Um, a big thing for me is exercise. Um, having appropriate exercise can be really, really helpful. Um, tired dogs are better behaved right. dogs. So my minimum goal for exercise is at least half an hour a day off the owner's property. You know, if you want to play ball and frisbee in the house and in the yard, that's great, but get them out for walks. Okay. So that can be walking, that can be off-leash running, that can be um, daycare. But dogs really need to have aerobic exercise. I mean, to just go for a walk, their nose is getting a lot of exercise, mm -hmm. but, they, but they also need that good aerobic mm -hmm. physical exercise. If you can. To, if you possibly if can. If you can. Okay. Mm -hmm. So playing ball, uh, doing things that are, are more physical and really getting mm -hmm. them tired out. And I, and I know that here at the shelter we see that a lot, that the majority of dogs in homes don't get enough physical exercise. Mm -hmm. And to know that that can add, you know, to a, a problem like this. It can, yep, because that energy has to go somewhere. Right. So exercise is one thing I ask people to do. Um, doing more training can help because with separation anxiety, the dog really lacks confidence in being alone. So doing training can really help to build the dog's confidence. So that can be some obedience training, teaching tricks. That could be going to a class. That could be starting to do agility. That could be doing nose work. So whatever starts to engage the dog and start to help to build their confidence can okay. be really, really helpful. That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, you talked about picking up car keys. So desensitizing triggers to departure can really help. And what I mean by that is um, dogs kind of get tuned into what we do before we leave. Right. So if you make a list of what those triggers seem to be, what makes them anxious, and start doing them out of context, that can be helpful. So, for example, maybe you go grab your keys, you grab your purse, you put on your shoes, but you sit down and eat breakfast. So those behaviors don't necessarily predict that you're leaving. Right. Or you might grab your coat and sit down and watch TV at night. Um, right. People who wear uniforms, that can be a big trigger. Um, so I'll have them try and put their uniform on Right. at a different time yeah. of day. I, my dogs know a particular coat. If I put a particular jacket on, they know the difference between we're going to the dog park right. or I'm going to work. And believe me, when I put that uh, dog park jacket on, they are at the door. Yeah. And so uh, I made the mistake one day uh, of putting that jacket on and they weren't going with me. And I thought, whoa. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you do have to be careful of, of what you're doing. And, um, and I think too, when we're hurrying around, Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you're in the habit of, oh my gosh, where, where's my briefcase, where, where is those papers, and where is this, and where is that, and then you grab your keys, grab your coat, and you leave, our anxiety is kind of rubbing off on the dog. Absolutely. So what I try to do is the night before or before I sit down and eat breakfast, I try to get all my stuff together mm -hmm. before I leave, and then I quietly eat breakfast, and then I'll get up, and I'll get my doggy treats, and I'll say, got to go to work, mm -hmm. and my dogs go down in their crate, and so they're not associating my rushing around with necessarily leaving. Yep. Uh, it's a different routine. And we do something, I try to do something a little bit different every day yep. to try those to are, help. Those are really great ideas. So keeping your arrivals and departures as low key as possible can be really helpful. So planning ahead, maybe opening your garage door so that's not a trigger, um, maybe even parking around the corner mm -hmm. uh, if that's helpful, taking things out to the car in advance. When you come home, just being really calm. When I come into my house, You'd wonder if I even like dogs, much less train them for a living. Because I come in, I put my mail down, I go about my business, mm -hmm. and then when the dogs are really calm, then they right. get greeted. Right. One of my dogs um, had separation anxiety when we adopted her. So keeping arrivals and departures can be um, uh, low-key, can be right. really helpful. It, it shouldn't be a big deal. You don't want it to be a big deal to your dog. Because right. I, I know that there's some people that, oh, honey, mama's got to go to the, got to go to work, and I'll be home soon. And, and the dog is probably like, 
oh my gosh, this must be really horrible that I'm going to be left alone. And then when they come home, there's all, also that, all, all that anxiety of, I think after you have a real excited greeting, um, then the dog is maybe even anticipating, okay, when are they going to leave again? Yep, and, and coming and going becomes this big emotional roller coaster for the dog. Right. A big piece of working with separation anxiety can be giving your dog something to do when you're gone. Okay. So the critical period for a lot of dogs is the first half hour. Not all, but for many dogs, the first half hour is when they are most anxious. So if we can find things that will engage them to keep them busy during that time, that can be really helpful. Okay. So, so I encourage people to experiment with different treats, different chews, you know, look at tendons, look at pig ears, look at, you know, anything that you can not find. Not a dry old biscuit or something that's not right. going to be entertaining. Up the, up the ante. Make yep. it worth their while, something that's going to be really exciting for them. And I see that you've brought some great toys mm -hmm. along, uh, toys and tools. Yep. Um, and they're, I believe all of them are like food dispensing. Right. So these are, uh, these are all different toys that you can use to put treats in, or you can use some of your dog's food. Again, for separation anxiety, I'd recommend using more treat items. Um, another thing you can do is to take a hollow bone. You can also do this with a con, but take a hollow bone and put something really yummy in it. So you can use cheese bread, peanut butter, cream cheese, brown schweiger. Um, one oh, of my that's favorite my favorite. Things. That's my favorite. Yep. This is one of my favorites. You can get it at a lot of pet stores. Um, it looks like summer sausage. <laughs> yeah, and you cut off a piece. And I microwave it to make it nice and soft. Mm -hmm. And then you can pack it into a hollow bone. And many dogs will keep working for quite a long time trying to get it out. And I might even put some of this in a little bit of cheese and then some more of this. Um, I do, tell, do caution people if you get this. Let the other people in your house know that it is, in fact, a dog food because you keep it in the fridge. Right. And I've had two clients now who came home and made a sandwich. Oh, okay. Well, it can't taste but, that bad, though. Yeah, it's very tasty. Okay. And dogs love it. It's very digestible. So that can you be, yeah. be used It's also in a great training tool. Uh, you know, f makes very small treats that for you to use for other training. You bet. So it's kind of a multi-purpose uh, mm -hmm. type thing, and my dogs really enjoy that. So yeah, um, they some do. of the other toys that you have here, we just have some, I think you have some, are these treats? Are these the diamond that treats? Is dry, that is dry food. Oh, that's dry mm -hmm. food. And so what, let's look at some of these other ones. This is a ball that you just put the treats in, and then the dog has to figure out how to roll it around and bounce it and right. to get the items out. Right. Um, this one is a little bit more difficult because it has these three lobes, and it doesn't bounce real easily. Okay. It doesn't bounce, all right. I mean, it doesn't roll like the other toys. Okay. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is called a twist and treat. And what's nice about this, if your dog is not familiar with food dispensing toys, you can make it really easy to start. So you can put food in, make it really easy. So that he gets a reward right away and, woo, I got a treat. And right. then he wants to keep playing with this because it keeps giving him a reward. Right, right. And then as they get better, then you can adjust it down tighter. Or if they get really good, you can even offset it. So something like this and these would be for um, dry treats? You or can use um, dry food or you can use tr um, treats. Okay, but you wouldn't be putting peanut butter in these particular items. I wouldn't. Um, this, the cons you can. Whoop, there's our con. And this one you can too. This is called a stuff a ball. You know, okay. you could put things in here. Or they say, the company says that you can put like cheese or peanut butter in these little vents on the side. Okay. So I primarily use treats and dry food. And depending on the toy, like uh, some of them are not as easy to clean. So this one, I'm going to be more careful about mm -hmm. what I put in. Like I wouldn't put cut up pieces of cheese in here. Right. They yeah, could get stuck. Could get and, gooey. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is another nice one too. This one's called a kibble nibble. Basically, you twist it apart and put food in. You know, and incidentally, okay. these, these toys are not necessarily just for dogs with separation anxiety. Um, All dogs could benefit from mm -hmm. having something to do while their do you owner bet. is gone. So let's, um, okay, so we have a variety of tools that we can use to keep our dog busy while we're gone mm -hmm. in that crucial first half hour. Um, let's take a little bit of a break and let's uh, introduce our audience to Maya, okay? Yes, ready, ready. Oh, come on, Randy. Animal shelter, here I come. And no, I'm not crazy or emotionally damaged. That's a stereotype. I just belong to a total loser. I'm a good dog. So if you want a pet, adopt. And if you see Randy, tell him he dropped his wallet.
Well, here we are with Maya. She is a beautiful dog, and I believe she is a rescue that mm -hmm. you rescued from uh, White Paws Rescue. She is, yep. And when you got her, she had separation anxiety, she and did. so this is something that you've been working with her on. And we're gonna see if Maya will demonstrate one of our one of the toys here. And we also wanna point out to people that there are some other things that they can do for separation anxiety, that there are, um, if you know that your dog has separation anxiety, there is um, medication that may help. Mm -hmm. There is, um, some dogs are put on, on a prescribed medication from their veterinarian. Some cases are more severe or more prolonged where it's really helpful to use medication as an adjunct. Um, there are a couple different calming remedies. People can use a DAP, which is something you plug in, and it dispenses pheromones that dogs give off when they're calm and relaxed. There are a whole host of different like liquid herbal products that people can use, and adding essential fatty acids to the dog's diet can help too. Uh, there's a product I like a lot called Esposid. Um, adding fish oil can also help because that helps increase omega-3s and 6s mm -hmm. and help increase serotonin in the dog's brain, which helps them be calm and relaxed. So those are all little things that people can do as well. Okay. Why don't you give her that and see if we can get her to demo how okay. this uh, dispenses. Uh, and I think it's very important too, Jody, that we mention to our audience that it's so important. If you suspect that your dog has separation anxiety, or even if your dog isn't totally house trained, it's so important not to punish your dog. Absolutely. Uh, punishment, all it does is make for a more fearful dog. Um, it just isn't, it isn't the right approach. Mm -hmm. The best thing to do is to just ignore it and try to work with the positive things that we can right. do. Right, punishment will absolutely make separation anxiety worse. Um, it's really hard sometimes for people to resist if they come home and their house is trashed or you know, there's urine and feces in the dog's crate, it can be hard not to, but it, will, it won't help, put right. it that way. Well, and a lot of times our own body language you know, right. conveys that we're upset. So sometimes you need to go outside and maybe, you know, pound on something outside or scream and yell and then come back in and, and deal with what's going on because the dog again is not doing it out of spite or to do it because they want to make you angry or they you know they don't love you or whatever they're doing it because this is actually <coughs> a problem that they have uh, and something that we need to work with right and the way I put it to my client Cheryl <coughs> is I tell them that basically your dog loves you so much that they just fall apart when you're gone. Yeah. So, so, so food dispensing toys can be really helpful. Maya did have separation anxiety when we got her. She would bark um, for quite a long time. Um, she was not real keen on being in her crate. Um, and she would so she would urinate and defecate if she was out of the crate. And if she was in the crate, she would bark and try to get out. So, um, but she's been fine now for about five months. Maya. So um, she really likes food dispensing toys. So you can see as she rolls it around, the food's going to come out. Victory. And so things like this would help to keep her busy when we were gone, at least to get her through the initial phase of our departure. And these can be used in and out of a crate. Of course, you need to have a crate that's big enough to accommodate a toy or at least give them some room to move mm -hmm. around. Um, or they can be used, be used out of a crate as well. So mm -hmm. another thing that we talked about was using a stuffed bone. And the stuffed bone was super, super helpful in working with Maya. Again, I've got this hollow bone, and if you're looking at a hollow bone, you just need to make sure you have a hole that's big enough for your dog's tongue. So if both holes are like this size, that's it's not, not gonna work. It's not really big enough. Yeah. So we want a hole that's big enough for their tongue to keep them really engaged and interested. Right. Right. And you also want to make sure um, some dogs chew the bone, so you mm -hmm. also want to be careful. Some dogs are hard chewers mm -hmm. that it can damage their teeth, so you want to make sure uh, you may want to check with your veterinarian to see right. if that, that is an appropriate toy. Uh, at our house, this is called the Bye Bye Bone. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have them in the summertime. I actually keep mine in the freezer, yep. so I have them ready to go. And uh, I also freeze my Kongs, makes it a little harder for them and you keeps bet. them busy longer. So let's give her that yeah. bone and see. Uh, hey, sweetie. So these can be used inside and out of a crate. Um, and as you mentioned, if someone's concerned about bones or their dog can't have beef, um, for some reason you can also use a Kong. Okay. And, and so we can, let's just put Maya in her crate. Hey, sweetie. Good girl. So you can also use um, cow hoofs. So you can take a cow hoof and stuff that. Okay. And so she can stay in her crate and she can chew her bone. And she's like, hey, well, sweetie. you let me have it out there, out there before. <laughs> so... 
And she may be even looking for a place to hide it because she was chewing on it while we talked right, for a little bit. Right. Well, and there are some dogs, I know one of my dogs, if I give, them some, give him something like that, he keeps it until I come home. And Maya. he enjoys it when, when I'm back Maya. home. Hey, sweetie. Oh, I know, that's a really good hiding spot. I think she's kind of full because she was chewing on this while we were talking before. But essentially, you know, they'll just sit and chew and lick and try and get the mm -hmm. stuff out of the middle. And that can be really, really helpful. Right. It really keeps them busy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a challenge to get that stuff out of there and uh, really makes the time go faster for them. And by the time they've worked at that for a while, hopefully they've relaxed enough and they're going to sleep, right. which is, you know, what we want them to do. And so. it gives them something else to focus on. So instead of sitting there being worried because you're gone, mm -hmm. it just gives them something else to do. You know, and something else, Jody, that I don't think we mentioned is um, turning on the radio <coughs> or turning on the television and letting that be company for your pet mm -hmm. uh, while you're gone at work all day. So a lot yep. of times even something as simple as that can help uh, make it feel like like you're there. So yep, and there's been some great research done on what kind of music you can use. Okay, um, you want to avoid things like rap or rock, or really heavy driving music. Right. You want to use new age Something music. Something that's going to put you to sleep. Listening. <laughs> and now there are even quite a few CDs that you can get called like Animal Healing, okay. or CDs that are just designed for dogs to help them relax. Wow, there's, there's a lot of information out there, Jody. And there is. We could go on and on about this. I hope our audience, you know, had a great time learning a little bit more about separation anxiety. Uh, if they want to learn more, they certainly can contact you, and mm -hmm. we'll put your information up on the screen and visit our website, www.oahs.org, uh, to find more information on separation anxiety and how you can uh, prevent it or uh, treat it if you really find out that your dog has separation anxiety. So I want to thank you again for being here today and taking the time for you and Maya to be with me. And so until next time, happy, happy tales, tales to you. you. Thank you.